What's up guys, welcome back. So the week that Elden Ring came out, I did the world's first ever one-shot challenge, only leveling one level each time that I was able to successfully one-shot a boss. After one-shotting the Elden Beast and finishing that challenge at level 69, I put together an Ancient Dragon Lightning Strike Faith build from that challenge that I thought was going to be the strongest possible build ever in Elden Ring. And while that build set YouTube on fire and you can't go to an Elden Ring channel without seeing it, one year later I put together a build that was even stronger. Flipping the bleed meta upside down and showing that strength bleed rather than dexterity bleed with the gargoyle's twin blades was the absolute pinnacle of DPS in Elden Ring. And now I've put together a build that can pull off both of these metas at the same time. And not only that, but we can target any boss weakness in the game. This build puts out the highest fire damage possible in Elden Ring. We also gain access to one of the highest damage magic incantations in the game. In fact, possibly the highest damage per cast magic spell in the game. And then if a boss is weaker to physical damage and you want to deal that damage from a range, you have that option as well. But don't be confused, this is not just a dragon build. With this build, we can still use Ancient Dragon Lightning Strike at such a high level that we can still one-shot anything in Elden Ring. And yes, that does include the Elden Beast. But the crazy part of this is that we do not need a lot of faith to do so. And because of this, we're scaling other things like Arcane, giving us access to S-tier bleed metas as well. Now this build would be insane in any of those three categories on its own, because at this point it's no secret that bleed, Agent Dragon Lightning Strike, and Dragon Communion Incantations are broken in Elden Ring. But the ability to pull off all three with one build is absolutely crazy. I've been very excited to show this to you guys. Let's dive in. But if you do enjoy this video, do us a huge favor and smash the like button. And if you want to see more like this, then feel free to subscribe. Also, leave your thoughts on the build in the comments down below for a chance to win a copy of Shadow of the Erd Tree, the new Elden Ring DLC. To show our appreciation for you guys, we're going to be giving away a free copy of the DLC to one lucky person in the comment section below. As usual, this build is going to be broken up into weapons, spells and skills, armor, talismans, buffs, and consumables. But before that, we're going to go over the stats in the starting class that I recommend for this build. Now, the most optimized class to hit these stats at level 150 is the Bandit class. Also, keep in mind that some of these stats are flexible, but I'll go over that individually. For Vigor, since we're a ranged build, 50 Vigor is more than enough. Honestly, for those that have played before, I'd say the 40 Vigor soft cap is probably enough, but 50 is a great place to stop. If you're brand new to the game, then take 10 points from Faith and push Vigor to 60. 15 Mind felt like more than enough to play this build comfortably, and then 19 Endurance is what we need in order to hit our 51 breakpoint with our armor and still medium roll. Then we're just putting enough into Strength and Dexterity to use the Scavenger's Curve Swords. Then I recommend 33 Faith to be able to use the Hal of Shaburi buff without relying on the Faith Knot tier, and this also puts us at 43 with our Faith Knot tier, which gets us almost all the way to that 45 soft cap for Hybrid Catalyst spell power scaling, and that applies to us because we're using a hybrid seal that scales off of Faith and Arcane. Speaking of Arcane, we're going to take this all the way up to 80 for several reasons. The first of which is that this is the soft cap for occult scaling weapons, and we'll be using that affinity on our Scavenger's Curve Swords, and that'll push us way beyond that 60 soft cap for the scaling on Blood Loss buildup as well. And then this obviously pushes us way beyond the soft cap for that hybrid catalyst spell power scaling that we were talking about. And the seal that we're going to be using actually scales with an S in Arcane. But as this graph clearly demonstrates, if you're not using bleed weapons, then feel free to take some points from Arcane and put it into Faith or Vigor. Alright, so let's take a look at the weapons, because this build's very unique in terms of the weapon choices that it opens up for you. The most important weapon of the build is going to be the Dragon Communion Seal. This seal raises the damage of Dragon Communion incantations by 15%. Now, if you came here from the OP early video, then you already have this. If not, then I highly recommend you go to that video and watch the detailed walkthrough for the Fringe Folk Heroes Grave. You're going to need two Stone Sword keys to get in, and this is in the area right at the beginning of the game. Just remember, you can also slow this video down to see what I'm doing here, but basically I just use the chariot to kill the enemies to get the Dragon Communion Seal. For those of you interested, I'm going to deep dive into the numbers on this at the end of the video. Now, if you wanted a taste of melee, on these stats, I recommend grabbing dual Scavenger's Curve Swords. Now, this item's just ground loot on a corpse in Mount Gelmir, but it's guarded by a grafted scion. Be sure that you're using the occult finity on this to take advantage of that arcane scaling. Now, since you can only grab one per playthrough, unless you have a friend to drop you a second one, I recommend grabbing the bandit's curve sword for your offhand. The easiest way to get this is to farm it from the skeletal bandits next to the church of pilgrimage, so you can actually get this very early on. Now, because this is also a curve sword, it shares a moveset with a scavenger's curve sword, so you still get that awesome curve sword moveset including that jumping multi-hit attack, the running multi-hit attack, and that really fast double hit L1 spam. It's also important to note that you want the blood affinity on the bandit's curve sword because it has no innate blood loss buildup, but again, more on that later. 
Ultimately, you want a second Dragon Communion Seal in your offhand, but on your first playthrough, if you don't have a friend to drop you one, you can always use the Jellyfish Shield. It's just ground loot on a broken wagon by some Jellyfish, and its Contagious Fury skill will increase all damage by 20% for 30 seconds. Speaking of awesome builds, if you're planning a PC build, or even an upgrade, in the near future, be sure to check out this week's sponsor, Jawa.gg. Jawa is a marketplace made for gamers by gamers. They have a group of verified sellers that offer completed builds for extremely competitive pricing. They also directly collaborate with both creators and other tech experts to constantly improve their platform to line up with our interests. The nightmare to building or upgrading a PC in 2024 is navigating the minefield that is GPU shopping. I spent months doing my research and trying to make a decision on the right GPU for my build. Jawa not only has a ton of sellers listing graphics cards at affordable prices, but Jawa will also purchase the GPU directly from the customers, making the process the easiest solution to selling a GPU. This is a great way to soften the blow of purchasing that newer model GPU to get that elusive 60 frames in 4K on Elden Ring. So gone are the days of taking photos and writing a listing hoping to find a buyer for your old GPU before upgrading. Now you can do it all in one place via Jawa's quick quoting system. Jawa even offers a ton of buying, selling, and troubleshooting assistance in a Discord community over 11,000 strong. They also host game nights, contests, and lots of giveaways. Definitely go check it out and interact directly with the Jawa team and the rest of the community. Also check out Jawa.gg on Trustpilot where they have a 4.7 out of 5 star rating. Their weekly newsletters are also a great way to get information on the great deals of the week, featured builds, and more. If you're dreading building that awesome new gaming PC and all the research and hassle that comes with it, then head over to Jawa and let one of their verified sellers build one for you. Use my link in the description below to visit Jawa.gg and find that upgrade or new build to take your game to the next level. Okay, so now you know what weapons to use, let's talk about spells and skills because that gives this build the diversity to one-shot everything in the game. Dragon Maw is cool because it's a physical damage skill, and you can purchase this right away with one Dragon Heart from the Cathedral of Dragon Communion. So you can get this really early game as soon as you have a Dragon Heart, and basically it channels a giant dragon head that bites the enemies in front of you. Agil's Flame is another good one that you can get early. All you need to do is kill the dragon Agil in the lake right next to the first steps, and then you can just purchase the spell from the Cathedral of the Dragon Communion after killing him. This will cost you two Dragon Hearts, but then it'll give you access to his Fire Breath attack. Now for enemies with Fire Absorption that are weaker to magic, I recommend Smarag's Glintstone Breath. All you need to do is kill Smarag just west of the Academy, and then you can purchase it at the Cathedral of Dragon Communion for two Dragon Hearts. This is very similar to Agil's Flame, but it will be a magic damage based breath attack. Exec's Decay is more than just a spell that applies Scarlet Rot, it's capable of doing great physical damage. All you need to do is kill Exec's, I highly recommend using its weakness to fire, and then purchase the spell at the Cathedral of Dragon Communion for two Dragon Hearts. So now you have a physical fire and magic option. Dragon Claw is another spell that can be purchased at any time from the Cathedral of Dragon Communion. It only costs one heart and it's a pretty cool spell, it has an immediate follow up attack. It has great AoE and it's good for exploration, but for bosses Dragon Maul is probably better. You want to use Seppuku on both of your scavenger's curve swords. This adds 30 flat physical damage and then 30 base bleed buildup, but that blood loss buildup is going to scale with your arcane so it's actually much much more. And this is just dropped by the teardrop scarab and the frozen lake up in mountaintops of the giants. So the armor might actually be the coldest part of this build. I don't think that you could throw a better armor set together for a dragon theme build than this. I used the scaled greaves because they gave us 20 poise and they matched surprisingly well. The veteran gauntlets gave 8 poise and also matched very well. The drake knight armor was always the only choice for a chest and it gives 19 poise. And then the 4 poise on the skeletal mask pushed us up to that 51 poise breakpoint. Like I said, I don't think you can hit 51 poise and find an armor set that looks better than this one. And what's crazy is this set looks even cooler from behind. Alright, now for the locations. The Skeletal Mask is just ground loot, it's in a chest in the Sage's Cave. And if you're familiar with the Raptor's Black Feathers, it's in the chest right next to it. Just follow the route that I show on screen and if you need to, you can always slow down the video. And you can run past all the enemies like I did. The Drake Knight Armor is also ground loot in a chest. And this is in Crumbling Farm Azula. Again, just follow the route that I show on screen and slow down if you need to, but it's pretty easy to find. You'll get the entire Drake Knight set here, but we just need the chest armor. I found the rest of the set lacking poise and fashion. Now the veteran gauntlets you're actually going to have to earn. For access to these you have to go and kill Commander Neol. After killing him you gain access to purchase any of his armor in the round table hold. So just head to finger reader Enya and buy the veteran's gauntlets. Getting the scaled greaves is pretty straightforward but you are going to have to fight for these as well. You need to head to the volcano manor and take the letter off the table. This is a bounty for old knight Isvan. So go back to Stormville on the place marked on your map and invade him. Then you need to kill him, and this should be pretty easy, honestly all you need is one cast of Agil's Flame. 
He'll even stand still and let you finish the cast and try to heal himself. Then when you get back to Stormhill, you're automatically going to be rewarded with the entire scaled set. And remember, you just need the Greaves. Talismans are a great way to scale your damage just like buffs, but unlike buffs, these are active all the time, which is extremely convenient. The first talisman I recommend is the Fire Scorpion Charm. This is just ground loot found on the ramparts on the outside of the wall on a wooden platform in Fort Lyde. This increases all fire damage by 12%, so be sure to have this equipped anytime that you use Agil's Flame. Now in similar fashion, whenever you use Smarag's Glintstone Breath, you're going to want to use the Magic Scorpion Charm. Now this works very similar to the Fire Scorpion Charm in that it raises all magic damage you do by 12%. Now in order to obtain this, you need to do Saluvis' quest line, which is pretty simple. He's going to ask you to give a potion to Nefeli. You can do what I did and hand it over to Gideon instead. Then you can go back and lie to him and tell him that you gave the potion to Nefeli, and then explore the hidden ruins nearby. At this point, he'll give you a puppet. You want to choose the Jarrite puppet. This is the more expensive of the two puppets. Now you only need two Starlight Shards, and you can go back and buy the other puppet. I also recommend grabbing the Amber Starlight before heading back. Buy the Finger Maiden puppet and give him the Amber Starlight. At this point, he'll give you the Magic Scorpion Charm, and you can feel free to betray him and go back to Ronnie. The next talisman that I recommend is the Blue Dancer Charm. And this is dropped by the Guardian Golem Boss in the High Road Cave. And this raises physical damage with lower equip weight. So the lower that your equip weight is, the more damage that you're going to do. Think of this as a physical Scorpion Charm. On a range build with so much damage, the Ritual Sword Talisman is a great option. This raises all damage by 10% when your HP is at maximum. This is in a chest in the Lux Ruins after defeating the boss Demi-Human Queen Gillica. You can get this very early. Now, on a dragon build, we're obviously going to want the Roar Medallion. We're not using Roars, but this also increases Breath Attacks by 10%. And Breath Attacks is going to be the primary source of our damage. This is dropped by the Stone Digger Troll at the bottom of the Limgrave Tunnels. You can also do this very early. Phlox Canvas Talisman raises the damage of all incantations by 8%. And you can get this early by progressing Millicent's questline up to Windmill Village, killing her there, and then going back to Gowrie's Shack to find him crying and killing him. Otherwise, you have to do Millicent's complete questline. This is optional, but if you find yourself dabbling in melee and you're using things like Bloody Slash or the Reduvia, I recommend grabbing the Shard of Alexander to raise the damage of your skills by 15%. To get this, you just need to do the bare minimum of Alexander's questline. So just talk to him after killing Radon, then talk to him again in the lava in Mount Gelmir, and then accept his challenge and defeat him in Crumbling Fire Missoula. And then at this point, he will give you the Shard of Alexander. The last talisman that I recommend is the Dragoncrest Great Shield Talisman. This reduces physical damage taken by 20%, so it gives you an effective 25% more HP. This is just in a chest in the building that's above the elevator that takes you down to Melania. One of the most appealing parts of this build is that you need very few buffs in order to do incredible damage. I use like 2 or 3 buffs for most of the game. The first one is Golden Vow, and this is a staple in any incantation caster build. This raises all damage by 15% and damage negation by 10% for 80 seconds. This is ground loot in the Corpse Den Shack. You'll be invaded, but you can just run away and despawn that invasion. You can pick up the Howl Shabiri in a chest on the second level of the Frenzy Flaming Tower. This is the reason we needed at least 33 faith on the build, and this raises all damage by 25% for 40 seconds. This is a huge damage boost, and it's a great duration as well. If you needed to squeeze out an extra 5% damage on any of your physical dragon spells, the Bloodwell Aromatic increases all physical damage by 30%. And this is a craftable item. You can pick up the Perfumer's Cookbook 2 in the Shaded Castle. And that's up in the northwest part of Altus Plateau. Now for your first tier slot, you're always going to use the Faith Not Crystal tier. This raises your face stat by 10 for 3 minutes. And it's just ground loot guarded by 3 Miranda Sprouts on the north coast of Weeping Peninsula. This will help damage wise with that face scaling side of the Dragon Communion Seal. Now you're going to swap back and forth in your second tier slot based on the spell that you're using. If you're doing magic damage, then you're going to want to use the Magic Shrouding Crack tier. This raises all magic damage by 20% for 3 minutes. And this is dropped by an Erd Tree Avatar that you can kill pretty early on. Now if you're doing fire damage, for your second tier slot, you're going to want to use the Flame Shrouding Crack tier. And this is dropped by the Putrid Avatar near the Minor Erd Tree in Kaelid. And this will increase all your fire damage by 20%. So just be sure you have this one equipped anytime you're using things like Agil's Flame. The consumables list on this build is pretty short and sweet, so let's just dive right into it. Obviously, if you're not doing some sort of one-shot challenge, feel free to use freezing pots to lower their resistances, but all that I used in this run were sleep pots. And these are craftable. You can pick up the Fever's Cookbook 1 on a corpse in a graveyard on the plateau southeast from Summon Water Village outskirts in Limgrave. And these are great because the sleep buildup scales with Arcane. Okay, so if you're still here, that means you're enjoying the video. 
So if you haven't smashed the like button yet, you should do so now. And if you're looking for a written checklist version of this guide, all of that stuff can be found over on our Patreon. So whether you're just looking to support the channel a little bit or you're looking for access to those custom guides, the link to our Patreon will be in a clickable element at the end of this video or in the description or pinned comment below. Also be sure to let us know in the comment section below what build you want to see as a one shot build next or any Elden Ring or Dark Souls content that you'd like to see. This is a great fight to show early on the strength of this build in its raw damage and its diversity. Because we do so much damage with every element we can target any boss's weakness. For Exikes that weakness is fire. We're going to target that weakness with Agil's Flame and then just use a simple 3 buff process and take that huge health pool down to nothing. As you can see we did almost 19,000 damage with just the first half of the cast. Had the death not interrupted the full cast we probably would have done close to 40,000 damage. Now I want to show you guys why this build with the Dragon Communion Seal is better than a pure faith build. Now for those that don't know, the Dragon Communion Seal and the Gravelstone Seal both raise the damage of their respective schools by 15%. So that means on this build, the Dragon Communion Seal has 358 incant scaling, but with the 15% increase, it has an effect of 411 incant scaling on Dragon Communion spells. On a similar strength faith hybrid build, it would appear the Erdtree Seal has the highest incant scaling, but if we're using Dragon Cold spells, then because of that 15% damage, the Gravelstone Seal pulls ahead with a 365 effective incant scaling. Now if you went with an Intelligence and Faith hybrid, you would see the exact same thing with the exact same numbers. And this is a good demonstration to show that sometimes you have to think beyond what the calculator spits out initially. And then if you went all out 99 Faith, we still see the Erdtree Seal falling behind the Gravelstone Seal, but only for Dragon Cold incantation spells which are some of the best boss killing spells in the game. So now armed with that information, we can demonstrate why this build is better. Dragon Communion spells do similar damage, but much more consistently than Ancient Dragon Lightning Strike. And when you cast those spells on this build, you have 411 incant scaling. You also get 358 incant scaling on all other incantations, including Dragon Cult incantations. Now on the flip side, on a pure faith build, you'll get 394 incant scaling on Dragon Cult incantations, but you only get 343 incant scaling on all other incantations. Unless you leveled and then swapped to an Erdtree seal for other incantations. Because of the incredibly high flat damage of Dragon Communion incantations, it's just kind of a no-brainer. Especially since you can still one-shot things with Ancient Dragon Lightning Strike. But on top of having higher peak incant scaling within its school, this build scales off of Arcane. That opens your build up to Bleed Weapons. Which is just another completely broken DPS meta in Elden Ring. Now speaking of bleed, let me clarify why I chose the two weapons that I did. When looking at the highest AR curve swords for our stats, we're only interested in the ones with blood loss buildup. It's no surprise with AD Arcane that the first one on that list is the Occult Scavenger's Curve Sword. But if you don't have two of those yet, the next on that list would be the Blood Bandit's Curve Sword. Now for a pure Arcane build, the Occult Scavenger's Curve Sword is always going to be the meta. And really it's just icing on the cake here. To have an incantation casting build that can one shot every boss in the game and still have perfect scaling for one of the bleed meta weapons. I do want to clarify here that this is not the best bleed weapon in the game. The best bleed weapon in the game is the gargoyle's twin blade scaling with strength in arcane. I get asked to clarify this a lot because of the misinformation being put out by your average algorithm spammer. But the TLDR here is that I did a very long very detailed dive into the data and whether the enemy was bleed immune like Muriel or they could bleed like the fire giant. The Gargoyle's Twin Blade is always going to do more damage than the Scavenger's Curve Sword. To break it down to its basic form, the Gargoyle's Twin Blades just have much higher AR and much higher blood loss buildup. So with similar endurance loss and identical attack animation time, in a real world fight you're just going to get a lot more damage every time that you punish, which just equals more DPS overall. So for a melee bleed build, Strength Arcane is still superior to Pure Arcane. Also make note that the Scavenger's Curve Swords are still an S tier bleed weapon. And the fact that this build can use both those and highly scaled incantations makes this the strongest overall build in Elden Ring. If you're looking for that full walkthrough of this build that starts at the OP Early Guide and ends at Elden Beast, that is going to be posted as a separate video on my wife's channel. Even trimmed down, it was about 45 minutes long, so it would have pushed this video beyond an hour. It's also the perfect opportunity to go and check out my wife's channel. So do me a solid and go show her some support now that she's coming out of her shell and narrating her own videos. And while you're there, be sure to check out the video that she just put out. It's an OP Early Grand Sax Lightning build, and it's probably the strongest OP Early build that I've ever seen for Elden Ring. And be sure to subscribe over there if you're wanting a notification for when the full walkthrough for this build launches.
Patrons. Huge shout out to our patrons. I'm going to do something a little different for you guys this time, and I'm going to post the full walkthrough as an early access for you guys there first. Thanks for watching, guys. Stay dangerous.